You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about Nevea Buchanan and the fact that she was abducted and possibly buried alive. What happens when a child isn't protected? When they are exposed to people who might not have their best interests in mind? It isn't their job to keep themselves safe. They're innocent, pure souls who shouldn't have to worry about the monsters of the world and definitely shouldn't be allowed to be around them when the adults know of this monstrous behavior. I will warn you, this one is difficult to hear, but I believe Nevea deserves justice and if she had to go through it, we should at least listen. It's the least we can do for her. If you don't know, it is my absolute passion to tell these stories, and I mean absolutely no harm or disrespect when I do so. This month is actually Foul Play February, so I'm going to be uploading a ton on Thursdays and Sundays. So make sure that you are subscribed and not missing out and coming back those days to watch the videos. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 2009 in Michigan and the Buchanan family lived in Monroe. Mother Jennifer and daughter Nevea lived at the Charlotte Arms apartment. Now Nevea Amaya had been born on February 3rd of 2004 and was this bright, bubbly, but quiet and energetic little girl who had just graduated preschool at five years old. She was more of a tomboy who loved playing outside and getting dirty. She didn't care about messing up her hair or getting messy in general. She loved stuffed animals too and her favorite was actually a beagle named Harley after the Harley Davidson motorcycles because she actually adored motorcycles and could hear them coming a mile away and would get so excited. Now her father was a man named Shane who was the former boyfriend of Jennifer but they were not currently together. Her name was actually heaven spelled backwards because her mother said that she was a little slice of heaven and everyone who knew her agreed. They said that she was a timid little girl with a soft voice and a real fragile, real precious individual. They said that her smile could melt a glacier and she adored her grandmother who is Sherry. She actually lived with them at this time and so Nevaeh was always trying to get her grandma to play with her, to run around, and Sherry said that Nevaeh was like her little sidekick. But on May 24th, investigators were called in regards to a missing persons case. The five-year-old Nevea had vanished. Her mother Jennifer said that that evening she had gone out to play with some friends and she had never returned home home. She went out to look for her and found her green and purple bicycle, but she was nowhere around it. Jennifer began asking neighbors and people nearby if they had seen where she had gone or what had happened to her, and people said that they did see her at some point throughout, you know, that afternoon, but they hadn't seen anything going wrong. They hadn't seen her leave. Nothing suspicious had happened. This was a bit strange because it was still daylight at this time, and this was a little girl playing outside alone, so you would think that some of Adults would have more of an eye on her, but they didn't have any fear in them that something would happen to her. Everybody thought that she would be safe. So investigators immediately got to work searching the area and they actually took Jennifer back to her apartment to talk to her about what had gone on that day. And by this point, Jennifer was a mess crying and sobbing and really was worried about her daughter. Jennifer said that she and Nevea had been home that day. It was, I believe, a Sunday, and so she didn't have school, and they were just kind of hanging out around the house. But Nevea was also going around playing with her friends at the apartment. There was tons of little kids, and they would all come together and, you know, play outside, or they would go to each other's apartments, and the parents kind of all knew that they were safe doing this because they would be at one apartment complex or the other, and they were just all friends and one of which was an eight-year-old boy named Austin who had just become friends with Nevea and she was so excited. This boy was like her best friend and they played together all the time. That day, Nevea would come back home and she actually had to change her pants because she had accidentally had a potty emergency where she had not gone to the bathroom in time and so she had to come home and change 
And, you know, this was something that Jennifer said would happen occasionally because Nevaeh would get so excited playing that she would forget if she had to go to the bathroom or she wouldn't want to get up and stop playing, so it would happen. And so she came home, she changed her pants, it was no big deal, and then Jennifer said that she was just sitting on the couch watching John and Kate Plus 8, which is just a TV show, and then she watched Nevaeh grab a popsicle and then she told her she was going back out to play with Austin. But Nevaeh never arrived back at the apartment that night and she was always coming home when it was dark outside. Now this is when Jennifer got a knock on the door and it was around 6 p.m. and there was a little girl outside. This was not Nevea, but this girl was saying that Nevea was riding her bike out in the street and Jennifer knew that this isn't something that Nevea would do. She knew to stay on the sidewalks and she would often go to a parking lot to ride around there, but she wouldn't normally go in the street. So Jennifer grabbed her shoes and she went out to start searching for her. And that is when she found her abandoned bicycle and nobody knew where she was. Jennifer said she immediately had this horrible gut feeling and the 911 call was placed at 8 p.m. At this point, the search was being broadcasted nationwide. People from everywhere knew about this little girl who had vanished and everybody wanted to know what had happened. The apartment complex where she had disappeared from actually buzzed with rumors and fear and the parents of all of the little children who would just roam and play with each other were then panicking looking for their own children worrying that their child had disappeared as well but all of the children were soon collected and nobody else was missing nevea wasn't one of the lucky ones though Residents were outside in their balconies watching whatever was happening and there were so many police cars in this parking lot. There were canines who were helping the search. There was helicopters in the air and the whole community gathered to help the police officers look for her. Meanwhile, a tip line center was created just for her case in case anybody had any information and investigators hoped that someone would come forward with this. But so far, even though they were getting tips, nothing seemed like a concrete statement. There were around 200 of them, but they weren't leading anywhere. Some even claimed to have seen Nevea after she vanished from the apartment, but those places where they saw them, Nevea was no longer there, or who they believed to be Nevea wasn't. So at this point, missing persons posters were created, and they said that Nevea was wearing a pair of long denim shorts, a light blue sleeveless shirt with red and white horizontal stripes and a white v-neck collar. She also didn't have any shoes or socks on. She had shoulder-length brown hair with brown eyes and stood at 3'8", weighing 45 pounds. There was also a $20,000 reward for for anybody who could come to the officers with information. Now these posters were also turned into yard signs who were put in the yards of people around the community so people just driving by could see them as well. And after canvassing the woods, quarries, the fields, the parking lots, and so much more, they were coming up with nothing. They were empty handed. The children at this apartment complex were questioned as well because investigators believed that because they were always out and playing, they knew Nevea, that possibly they could have some more information that the adults didn't know or didn't see. And so they brought these kids in and they tried to make it, you know, as comfortable as they could because they were children. But these children had so much to say. The only problem was none of their stories really matched. They weren't cooperating each other's stories. It just seemed like they all had different information they were spewing and investigators couldn't say that that meant that it was the truth. One said she was stabbed. One said she went off into the woods. Another said she went into a green minivan and investigators couldn't tell if they had actually seen something or if their imagination was running wild or if they heard something and went with it. And so that was the issue with statements from children as much as you want to believe them, they can sometimes be easily persuaded by people, by situations, and it makes it really hard to know if it's correct information. Austin was talked to as well as the little girl who knocked on Jennifer's door, and even after all of this, they were just in the same exact place. The children had seen her, they were worried about her, but they didn't really seem to know anything. With no one hearing what happened to Nevea, and even though they had seen her earlier, they knew she was there, she was outside, and it was still light outside, it made many wonder if Nevea knew who she had gone with. 
Now she was comfortable enough not to scream or cry out. Of course, that's if she wasn't immediately hurt and you know her voice was muffled upon the kidnapping, but it would be very hard to not have a child make any noise at all if they were going with a complete stranger. By 12.30 p.m. the next morning technically, but it had only been four hours since she disappeared, an Amber Alert was finally issued. Now, the Michigan's Amber Alert program has quite a high success rate actually and especially during this time the majority of children were found within hours they were safe and they were sound but unfortunately that would not be the case with Nevaeh. The morning hours after this were stress-filled for everybody. Everybody was trying to keep hope alive but at the same time the hours were going by they had no information and they didn't know even where to go from there. Jennifer was said to be very hollow-eyed that she kept involved with the case but she was obviously distraught but none of these people were giving up even the officers who had been up all night long. Meanwhile two men were being taken into custody and this was more related to the case than anybody knew. The next day, hundreds showed up at Kmart because that is where they were going to start another search. This time they sent divers into the water in the area, the bodies of water, but once again they didn't find anything. Now, Nevea had been missing for four days now. There were about 500 tips that had been sent in and 100 federal, state, and local police were a part of this case. They were doing their best to get on top of it, but the problem was there was nothing to get on top of. They had brought in 240 people to be questioned at the police station, but none of whom they considered to be a suspect. The entire community was affected by this. It wasn't just Nevaeh's family. Everyone in Monroe wanted to find her alive and the local high school students even began wearing yellow. They would put up yellow ribbons everywhere to show support. It seemed like everybody was being talked to in the community and some took offense to this, that they were being looked at as a suspect. Others said that the officers were just doing their jobs, but really, since there were no suspects, anybody could be. Six days missing and the first candlelight vigil had brought everyone together once again. Now there were about 700 tips by this point and there would soon be so much more. This is because America's Most Wanted actually did a segment on Nevaeh and that caused 100 tips to come in basically overnight. This resulted in a tip that investigators believe could lead them to a suspect. This tip had said that a man had been at the apartment complex that Nevea lived at when she went missing, and he was also seen burning items in his backyard afterwards. Now, this was a 64-year-old man named James Easter who worked at a steel factory before retiring. He actually had tons of sexual content on his computer and had a charge of indecent exposure. James said he was at this apartment because his girlfriend lived there. However, he also had an alibi from receipts showing that he was at different stores during the time of the abduction or thought to be the time of the abduction. And his home was searched and blood was found in the bathroom as well as on a blanket. However, this was tested and it didn't match Nevea. Nine days missing and even with the Amber Alert searches, rewards, social media pages, and the FBI help, they still were just as confused as they were that first day. FBI claimed that it could take years to find answers, but the public was also told at this time they were looking into an ice cream truck driver, and they were also looking into two vans, a silver and a green one, that was last seen near an elementary school. This was an ongoing search, and hope for answers was dwindling. 11 days missing, and answers would finally be found. Well, some of them. You see, it was June 4th and 10 miles from Nevaeh's home, two fishermen, Guy Bickley and his son Ryan, had called the police to tell them they had found a body. Now, they were fishing at a river raisin and they found a tiny body on the bank. However, it wasn't just lying there. It had come up on top of a shallow grave that was covered by concrete. We begin with breaking news, a tragic end to the search for Nevaeh Buchanan. The body of the five-year-old girl has been found near the River Raisin. 
Deputies have spoken to the family, confirming that their little girl is dead. Yeah, two fishermen discovered Nevaeh's body. It's pure evil. That, that's not even mean, that's not even rotten, that's not even psycho, that is literally pure evil. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> this area was said not to be very easy to get to which is why it took 11 days to find her and two hours later investigators showed up they got her body and dna tests were done and they did confirm that it was nevea buchanan she was too decomposed to be recognized. She was brought in for an autopsy and investigators had to do what no investigator looks forward to and that was telling her family. It was said that the family members howled in grief and a whole bunch of friends and the community gathered in the courtyard to basically pray and give support to the family. But the next day, it was officially announced to the public they had found her and her crime scene ended up being a place where many people went to grieve. I am not gonna give up my hope yet until I actually see her myself. Nevaeh's grandmother will get the opportunity to look at the body found in the next few days. Until then, she feels no closure. I just feel in my heart until I know that I see her face to face, then I'll know more. It was difficult, it was difficult. I cried, but just imagine what if it's somebody else. Right now, I'm not crying right now because I'm angry more than I am, you know, but I got tears in my heart, but I'm just really angry at this person. She carried that child down there and throw her in the clothes of the water and let us suffer and do what they did to her. That child didn't deserve that. That child does not deserve anything. But her autopsy would reveal an even more horrific story. You see, it indicated she had died of asphyxiation, but she'd also inhaled dirt meaning that Nevaeh was buried alive. The autopsy report said, the autopsy results have revealed that Nevaeh's death was caused by aspiration of fine particle material, dirt. This means that Nevaeh's face was forcibly maintained or embedded into a dirt surface. Whether this resulted from another person forcibly pressing her face into dirt or whether she was buried alive could not be determined. Two days later, a white and pink casket was brought in for her and then a Harley motorcycle hearse came to pick up her body and transport her to the St. Joseph Cemetery. She had a tombstone placed there that read Monroe's Angel because that's how everybody looked at her. Now, her grandmother, Sherry, and the sheriff, who was Crutchfield, both believed that her killer was someone local to the area. Sherry also believed she knew, Nevea knew her killer as well. Now, CNN's Nancy Grace then asked the mother, Jennifer, for an interview. Nancy appeared to have the full belief that Nevea's mother was responsible for her daughter's disappearance. Now to explain to you why she would even come to this conclusion, I need to explain a little bit about Jennifer's past because we haven't gone into that yet. And it has been speculated that Jennifer had been addicted to drugs for quite some time. Now we're not sure that, we can't confirm that, but we can confirm that in August of 2006, when Nevaeh was only two years old, Jennifer was arrested for home invasion. Now she was sentenced to a year in prison and during this time, her mother, Nevaeh's grandmother, Sherry, took care of Nevaeh and Sherry became more like a mother to Nevaeh than Jennifer. In fact, Nevaeh called Sherry her mom. After this though, Jennifer was said to want to do better when she got out of prison and she moved in with her grandmother and her daughter and they were all living in this one apartment. She didn't have a job, but her mother, Sherry, did. But the fact that Jennifer had been to prison wasn't the worst part. You see, when investigators were asking her about her friends and anybody who was around Nevea that could possibly be involved, she started naming off friends, people from the apartment complex, but she also talked about the fact that she had one of her friends and her daughter living with them in that apartment at the time, and she also had two guy friends who would come around often. These men were 48-year-old Roy Lee Smith and 39-year-old George Kennedy. Jennifer even said she dated George Kennedy for a while and that George was like a father to Nevaeh. 
that she would run up to him and hug him anytime he would come in. And now that they had broken up, they were still friends. But upon looking into these men, investigators quickly learned that they were both sex offenders. George Kennedy had been arrested for fourth degree criminal sexual conduct and accosting children for immoral purposes. He had sexually assaulted a 15 year old girl behind a gas station a year prior to Nevaeh's disappearance. He forced her to kiss him, he gave her marijuana, and he had been given a year in prison. Roy Lee Smith had been charged with the assault of a woman in his car twice, and he served 15 years for multiple sexual misconduct convictions. However, his mother claimed that this was only because his girlfriend, who was 24 and legal, had hollered rape and his mother basically was victim blaming this girl. These two men were the men that I talked about that were taken into custody during Nevaeh's search because after hearing this, this violated both of the men's probations. Their homes were also searched for evidence of Nevaeh Buchanan because investigators feared they could have something to do with it. Now, blood was found on the sink of a hotel room that George Kennedy was staying in, and it was tested for DNA, and it wasn't a match. However, there were three mini motorcycles inside his apartment, as well as a photo of a girl who looked a lot like Nevaeh. Now, Jennifer was asked if she knew they were sex offenders, and she claimed that after a few months, she knew that they were on the sex offender registry. But she believed in second chances, and George told her that this sex with his 15-year-old was consensual. And so she said that Nevaeh was never alone with him and she felt comfortable about all of it. Both Roy and George were sent back to prison for a time. However, this wasn't for the murder of Nevaeh. It was also because they refused to register as sex offenders. I'm pretty sure that probably someone associated with George or his girlfriend or a few other, I don't know. Many were concerned that a mother would allow their daughter to be around a sex offender knowingly. And this is what is said to have caused the heated exchange between Jennifer and Nancy Grace. Now here is the interview, but I urge you not to take on the, the emotions of either sides because this is a very, very heated exchange and you really want to be able to see both sides and kind of see each of their reactions, the timeline of events, and just try to keep a clear head about it because it can really get you angry and upset and confused while listening to this. So bear that in mind and I'll roll it right now. Ms. Buchanan, thank you for being with us. Hi, Nancy. Ms. Buchanan, you said that authorities cannot identify the body. Why? Um, I'm assuming that she's too decomposed for anyone to look at her physically. Miss Buchanan. They wouldn't recommend it. What happened? Take us through the last moments that you were with Nevaeh. What happened? The last moment that I was with my daughter. The last um, few moments, yes. She come in the house, she changed her clothes. After she changed her clothes, she said that she was going back upstairs to her friend's house. Mm -hmm. And? Grabbed a popsicle on the way out the door and she, you know, I didn't see her. The last time I seen her was at 6.30. At what time? 6.30. 6.30 p.m.? Yeah. Was it getting dark? No, no, not here. What time does it get dark? It doesn't get dark until approximately around 9, 9.30 here. Huh. When did you learn Nevaeh was missing? About, about a half an hour after she went outside. Uh, I had a, a really good friend of mine and her daughter stay the night with us. And my good friend's daughter came in and she said, Nevaeh's outside riding her scooter in the road. And that's whenever I immediately got up and I looked for my shoes. It took a couple minutes, a few minutes to look for my shoes. And then after that, I went outside and I noticed that she was missing and called her name, looked through apartment buildings, went to a couple, quite a few of her friends' houses, thinking that she could have been, you know, in one of their homes. I looked for her at least 
45 minutes. You stated that it was about 30 minutes later when the little girl came and said, Nevaeh's outside on her scooter in the road? 30 minutes had yeah. passed? Yeah, because she told me that she was going back upstairs to her friend's house, and that's assuming where she went. Now, you stated that you, quote, got up. Where were you? I was just sitting right there on the, uh, I was sitting right there on the couch, and um, I was like thinking about what I was gonna make for dinner, because it was around dinner time too. And she told me that she wasn't hungry at the moment, but I knew that she had to eat something. So she come in and she grabbed a popsicle on the way out the door, and that's normally about when I know she's getting hungry. There's a lot of times that she's told me no, but you know, she lies. She lies. Did, did you just say As, the little girl lies? About her hunger. She lied about her, she, normally she lies about her hunger. Miss Buchanan, I was just listening to what you said on the airwaves in the radio uh, interview and you stated something about George Kennedy may have owed somebody some money? I'm not too sure. Now, how could that I'm not possibly too sure on how could that possibly be linked to your daughter's disappearance? The fact that this sex offender friend of yours owed somebody some money, how could that remotely be linked to your child's disappearance? I honestly don't know. Well, what you're the I one that said it, so you must have known something. All these scenarios are just running through my head constantly. And I think that possibly he might have owed someone money and is to get to him is through a close loved one or you know anything all these thoughts are just running through my head you also stated in an interview that in your mind you hold him responsible i don't put it past him okay if you don't, don't put, put it past, past him, anyone if you don't put it past him what were you doing exposing your daughter to him Well, Nancy, I know that I've made, I've made a lot of bad choices. Yes. And who hasn't? And well, you know what? I you know can just stop right there. Somehow, you can just stop right there, Miss Buchanan, because most mothers that I know have never knowingly exposed their little girl, a five-year-old little girl, to a sex offender. So when you say who hasn't, I for one haven't. I haven't. Well, I just believe that everyone deserves a second chance. You know, and that's an and interesting point, Mr. Cannon. You know, because Mr. Kennedy has a rap sheet dating back, we believe, Prior to 2001, there's marijuana possession, there's home invasion, there's criminal sex conduct accosting children, there is the rape of a 15-year-old girl that he said was consensual. I mean, I'm counting them up on my hand. I didn't learn about all those. I didn't learn about all of those until after I got to know him, like maybe a couple of months after I got to know him. Yes, I did check him out. I confronted him about it, and especially about the other girl, and he completely told me that she was 15, he was 26, and it was consensual. It, they're not really... There's no such thing as consensual sex with a 15-year-old in that jurisdiction. That is rape, all right? Now, you just told me that you found out about two months after getting to know him, but even knowing about this rap sheet, this very extensive rap sheet, you still had him around your daughter. Why? Because I knew that I was going to keep her close. And she was never left alone with him, to my knowledge. Okay, never to your left knowledge. alone with him. Really? Is, uh, Ms. Howerton, Holly Howerton, friend of Nevaeh's mother. Ms. Howerton, are you there 24-7? No, I'm not. I have been with her ever since her child has been missing. And well, know you know what? That's been... really not doing a whole lot of good, is it? If you're not there 24-7, then you don't know what happened. And my question is, forget about the sex offender 
just for a moment, let's just suspend our disbelief for a moment. The five-year-old is out playing. It's nearly dark outside. I, I'm just having a no, problem. No, the sun's still out. It's not dark at all. Well, you said 6.30, and then 30 minutes later, that puts it at 7. Isn't that correct? You still haven't seen your mm -hmm. daughter. The daughter is gone. You said it gets dark around 8 or 9 o'clock. Yes, no. 9, 9.30. Oh, so now it doesn't get dark till almost 10 p.m. That's not true. Here it is. Miss Buchanan, it doesn't get dark at 10 o'clock at night in your jurisdiction. In Detroit Between area, nine and on nine that 30. day, the sun set 8.55 p.m. Exactly. So, your child is out. It's been 30 minutes since you last saw her. Did you think maybe I should check on my preschooler? See if she's dead or alive? I mean, did that cross your mind? Uh, no, because I knew that she was upstairs at her friend's house until the little girl came to me and said that Nevaeh was riding her scooter in the road. How did you know That's she was upstairs? Did you check on her? Did you go up there ever? No, she's... I watched her walk in through the door. Really? Because earlier you said she, she went we out were, the door. We were just... We just got home. She changed her clothes, everything else. I went upstairs at one point. I watched her walk in through the door. I came back downstairs. I went, went inside. Because see, in your first version, in your first version, you never got off the sofa. She took a popsicle, went out the door. You never said anything in your first version about watching her right, walk upstairs. I was, still, I was first sitting down. I got back up. I watched her walk up there. She come back downstairs. She changed her clothes. She walked back out the door with a popsicle. And then that's whenever I was like, she said, Mom, I'm going back upstairs to Austin's house. Now, Jennifer ended up walking out of that interview, and I completely understand the anger from both sides. Nancy for hearing that Jennifer would allow her daughter to be with a sex offender, and Jennifer for going on this interview, trying to find her daughter's killer and then being blamed to, for being the killer because, you know, if she's not, that would be horrific to be blamed for being your daughter's killer or for being involved at all. However, I would like to know if you think that Jennifer knows what happened or if she feels guilty about it. Can you sense that through the interview? Did you see anything strange? Please leave that down below. But after this, Jennifer did go on another interview and she said that she has been shunned. She had been treated poorly, that she's completely innocent yet people don't believe her. She said she didn't do drugs, she barely drank, and she didn't owe anyone money. She said that she almost had no enemies and didn't know why anybody would want to take her daughter. Now, Nevaeh's grandmother, Sherry, wanted to know why her autopsy didn't check for sexual assault. This was a question that many had as well. However, during another interview, Jennifer said that it actually did check and that there were no signs of sexual assault and that she also had no drugs in her system. Now, it was confirmed that no drugs were found, but it has never been released whether she was tested for sexual assault or those results at all. Now, many say this is because this is an ongoing investigation and they don't want to give out all the information because her case is still unsolved. Now, the tips came in frequently and they just kept coming. There was almost 1,000 tips by this point. And the next year, there was actually an event hosted in her honor about um, classes with child safety and teaching children how to spot danger. And there was also games for them to play. And a memorial bench was also placed at the preschool playground for Nevaeh. At this point, her reward money was up to $50,000. And two years after her murder, posters were still being handed out. And Jennifer said it was frustrating that it had been so long, but she still had hope that they were getting closer. There is a whole community on Facebook and off called Justice for Nevaeh that want answers. And they have been putting together multiple events over the years for Nevaeh. The fisherman who found her body actually said that no one fishes in that area anymore because of Nevaeh and to honor her. But sometimes the fishermen who found her go by there just to remember 
her and, and what happened to her. Three years after her murder, Sheriff Crutchfield finally had an update. He claimed that they were closer to arresting her possible killer. However, six days later, he said that that didn't check out and they were back to square one. However, five years later, it was 2014 and an article was written saying that investigators believed they knew who did this to Nevaeh. That he was actually in prison for another felony charge and had never been named as a prior suspect in this case. There is now a Nevaeh Buchanan preschool scholarship fund to pay for children of families who can't afford to put their children through preschool. And so it helps them to be able to go where Nevaeh had graduated from. But for her 10th anniversary, there was a dinner put together with a choir and speakers and everybody just wanted to remember little Nevaeh Buchanan. She would actually be 17 years old today. Now, George Kennedy and Roy Lee Smith are on probation today, living their lives, but do you think that they had anything to do with this? It seems like it could definitely be something that people should have looked more into. Her grandmother, Sherry, was so angry. She wanted answers, and unfortunately, she passed away before she could be given any of them. I don't want to have to wait any longer and not know what happened. Sherry keeps evidence bags at home. Well, it gives me comfort. It gives me comfort. Nevaeh's things that the little girl loved. Don't you think someone knows who did it? And don't you want I, that person to call? I wish they would. I really do. Because I have many nights that I can't sleep. The only way that I can sleep is I ask God up above to have Nevaeh to come to me or to come to that person that took her and to let them know that she's not gonna give up. Jennifer has given more interviews, but she didn't wanna show her face and she definitely lives a more private life now. She also says that she hasn't spoken to police in years. Now on a website set up to help get justice for Nevaeh, there was actually a tab that is called Nevaeh's message to her killer. And this says, tell me, how do you sleep at night knowing what you did to me? When you fall asleep, do you hear my heart beating? Do you hear me breathing, giggling, crying? You were once five just like me. Tell me, did I deserve this? Please, call 734-457-6713. Tell them what you did or what you know so that we can all rest in peace. From Nevea. So many believe that those two sex offenders who were allowed to be around this five-year-old girl could have had so much to do with it if investigators could have found one thing to connect them. I think the little motorcycles in George Kennedy's hotel room says so much. He knew that little girl liked motorcycles. It seems to me he could have gotten them and had them there for her to play with. Perhaps it didn't start out with murder that he wanted. Perhaps he lured her back to his place so he could sexually assault her. And then maybe he got scared she would talk and he killed her. It's heartbreaking. And Nevaeh Buchanan served better than this. But do you think your mother Jennifer had anything to do with it? Does she know what happened? Is she keeping this a secret? Or is she a grieving mother who's, who has been blamed for her daughter's death? But then again, I can see the anger towards her, even if she doesn't know about what happened to her daughter. Because who in their right mind lets their kid around someone like that and thinks that's okay? Remember, this is Foul Play February, so I'll be uploading so much, so make sure to come back. And don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough, and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.